Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who are looking in, we've got a good crowd tonight. And those of you who are here, um, we're so glad you could be with us. This is the second of this semester's President's Lecture Series. Tonight, Dr. Ray Mitch will be speaking to us about surviving and thriving during a global pandemic. Dr. Mitch is no stranger to CCU. He is a professor of psychology, the chair of our Department of Psychology. He received his BA at Wabash College, his master's at Indiana State University, and then he went on to get his PhD also at Indiana State University. Dr. Mitch uh, spent a lot of time in the Midwest. We were just talking about that. Uh, he was a staff psychologist at Michigan Tech University in the Upper Peninsula. He lived in Illinois where he was beginning with the Minerth Meyer Clinic in Wheaton. Uh, he started the Cornerstone Counseling Center in 1993. He came to work um, in conjunction with the Ministry of Promise Keepers in men's ministry. He has been working with missionaries from all over the world involved in field-based crisis intervention, candidate assessment, post-field debriefing, as well as trauma debriefing. Uh, he has had a varied career. He's dearly loved at CCU. He's authored five books, Grieving the Loss of Someone You Love. He's a uh, licensed psychologist here in Colorado, has four daughters, he and his wife, Linda. We're so glad to have him here. Let me tell you just uh, why we asked Dr. Mitch to speak to us. The events of this year have been unprecedented, at least in our lifetime. And um, just un unusual. In fact, I was having a conversation with my 96 year old father. And I said, have you ever experienced in your long life anything quite like this? And he candidly said, well, the depression uh, was uh, the Great Depression was was hard, but he said it was different from this because you weren't isolated from people. You could at least gather with friends and go out to eat and and things like that. So he said this is so different. Well, we know it's different. This year, early on, our lives were upended by the coronavirus pandemic. It upended world health, business, commerce, higher education, and our own personal lives. Uh, we are glad to be at this point in the crisis. We can see some light on the horizon, which I'm very thankful for. We have adjusted, but still we're deeply affected. And the question came to mind, what is it doing to us? For the elderly who have been shut in, they are shut out. For older people, they've felt and threatened about getting sick. They've been living in fear. For younger people, their dreams have been upended or altered in significant ways. For faculty on our team here at CCU, they've been working on multiple formats, putting in extra hours, working in off hours just to compensate for the changes, the really distinct changes of this semester for staff. They've been managing extra things, watching over the life of the university like many other university staffs. They've had extra meetings, extra reading to stay abreast with what's really happening, extra reporting, extra planning. You make contingency plans and then contingency plans for the contingency plans. And through it all, you don't get a normal summer. You keep going, you keep going through the weekends. And all of this, we, we don't quite realize what it is doing or has done to us. So the question arises, are we surviving? Can we thrive? during a pandemic like this. Here to speak to us, would you please welcome Dr. Ray Mitch. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sweeting, and for uh, the tremendous honor this represents in, in uh, speaking at this lecture series. It's certainly my pleasure. Um, I want to start out just with a story, uh, and the, it, it starts on a typically sunny, very bright day in May of 19, uh, 19 oh my gosh, 2005. 
I had to attend to the gutters of my house because a fairly rude rainstorm reminded me of how full they were. So I had the, uh, the unfortunate um, occurrence of having to get up on the roof and clean the gutters out. Thankfully, I had my daughter, my second oldest daughter, to come up and help me. And once we were finished, I told her that, let me go down, I'll hold the ladder for you, and then you can come down and I'll, we'll, we'll get down safely. Um, the problem was, was getting down the ladder. And so I stepped on the ladder and I noticed that it was a little loose and I thought, yeah, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll keep going, which is kind of what I tend to do. So I kept going and I stepped on the first rung of the ladder and it began to slip. And I went to grab the gutter, but gravity won and I dropped 16 feet and me and the concrete met and the concrete won. After that, everything went black, and I remembered uh, looking down at my leg and seeing that my foot was fairly going in the wrong direction. And so I, I, I didn't really feel anything. It, it's kind of one of those weird moments of consciousness where all of your senses are kind of suspended. And so the next thing I remember was the, the very, very bad breath of a EMT who was yelling at me, and I swear to goodness that his bad breath could have doubled his smelling salts. I, I, it was like, okay, I'm awake, I'm awake already. And he's kind of yelling at me and saying, hey, look, it's okay, we're, relax, we're gonna fix you up, relax. And now I'm looking at that saying, relax, really? When my foot, never mind. So, as the saying goes, the rest is history. Uh, ambulance ride on Cinco de Mayo in Denver, which is always traffic free. We had a clear sailing. My wife pulling pieces of the uh, roofing material out of my beard and laying there screaming bloody murder because the surgeon was trying to stitch my, my eyebrow back where it belonged in spite of all the morphine that I had. I mean, I, I was pumped full of it. It's so much so that they were trying to debate whether or not to take me into surgery or not. So the next thing I remember, the next morning, and, and I didn't know any of this, but the next morning I wake up and the doctor is in visiting and I look at him and say, so what are you gonna do to fix my leg? <laughs> and he pulls back, you know, the covers and says, here, look, and that was great. It was, my leg was two or three times the size it should have been and felt very much like concrete. As a matter of fact, uh, looking back on that now and looking back over the damage that was done, I ended up with a fractured femur, a closed head injury, a fractured orbital bone, at least that was the, the, the going theory, but later on that was ruled out, <clears throat> but, all I worried about at that point in time was just surviving. That was all. Uh, I went through a day and I, if I made it through the day, that was all that was necessary. As a matter of fact, that's the very definition of surviving, to continue to live or exist. And that certainly was what I was doing in the aftermath of that accident. I just focused on continuing to live, nothing more, nothing less relatively low bar, I grant you. But I had PT, who, by the way, I'm sure, PT, physical therapists, I, they're great people, but I'm sure they're of the lineage of Marquis de Sade, where we get the word sadist. So PT was twice, three times a week, um, and uh, a weekly blood, blood draws, which gets you fairly comfortable or uncomfortable with needles and a variety of doctor's appointments for follow-up. I also had the emotional cost of seeing my family struggle because I was the sole income at the time. The intervening years before I came to CCU was characterized by what many people would call a desert experience. It was me and my family living at a survival level, getting by, making do, and expecting less, just less of anything. And during that time, I faced down some pretty difficult questions about myself, 
my future, God, my relationships, my relationship with the world around me. And as a, as a matter of fact, those desert years, and yeah, I said years, living as survival in, in, in that increment of time shaped me who I am today. And one way of thinking those years of survival actually shaped my understanding for what thriving actually is. See, our world depends on contrasts. How do we know the beauty and wonder of joy if we don't experience sorrow? How do we understand surviving if we don't have some understanding of thriving? So today, I'm, I'm reminded of this need of thriving because every morning I wake up and I turn on something in my head in order to control the pain that's the leftover effects of that accident. I have neurostimulators in my head to control the pain because I live with pain every day. So thriving or surviving is literally a daily choice for me because I'm reminded time and time again of those years, but also where I am today, which thankfully in a lot of cases, our, our sense of thriving comes and goes. Oftentimes it's a moment. It may not be an entire period of time. We can, sur we can survive, but there's, that's a low bar. Now, you may be wondering <laughs> why I'm carrying this little device around. And in orthopedic surgeon's language, this is called a femoral nail. This uh, device is titanium, actually. I, uh, the, the doctor that um, used it to repair my femur, which is right about here, used it to repair my femur, and about nine months later, he decided he needed to take it out again because I was in such pain. So he took it out, handed it to me, and said, here, make a wind chime. It will be the most expensive wind chime in history. <laughs> it's like, no, I'd rather hock it and get a Ferrari, but that's, eh, that's something else. So what I want to do getting into this is I want to I provide you with just a couple caveats um, about what I'm going to say. And, and um, I am not going to quote chapter and verse about surviving and thriving and all there is to it because it tends to be a very personal, practical subject. My intention tonight is invite you into thinking about where you are personally since the effects of the pandemic is far from global, that magnitude is global, but the effects of it are personal and practical in terms of how we want to respond. And that's always before us when we're talking about such things. So I want to reflect on that. And, and then I also want to reflect on what I have heard from students rather loudly at times about surviving this thing and what kinds of things they try to figure out how to do, because I think it's instructive. See, this is one of these moments where my students teach me more about life than I can possibly ever hope to teach them. So let me, let me just start with our surviving. I'll put this down so nobody else freaks out about it, given the fact of where it was. And so what, what is surviving? First, the one thing I want, want to say is whenever I start talking about this stuff, a lot of times our temptation is when I'm talking about something that's a little too close to home that you might say, well, this, is, this isn't the same as what I've got, so it really doesn't count. See, there's a temptation for us to kind of push this stuff away because, I, you know, I, I, I don't know where the connections are. And that's the challenge that you have tonight when I'm describing some of this stuff is, is there's, there's markers here that relate to what we're gonna be talking about tonight and trying to understand. So first we have to talk about something um, in, 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 that is related to and in psychology. What we talk about ultimately is Abraham Maslow and his groundbreaking work. We can't have an understanding or talk about survival or thriving without understanding how we get our needs met. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs presented this idea where once we get at our level of needs uh, met at one level, we tend to move to the next and think about those sorts of things. And when we, when we get those met, then it seems like we have the space 
maybe the emotional, physical, even the spiritual space to consider getting these other needs met as well. When we get stuck in the survival mindset is when we tend to stay put with the physiological needs and the safety and security needs. Now, let me take you back to my own experience because my days basically were reduced to taking pain meds, going to doctor's appointments, eating, sleeping, complaining, grousing, grumbling. All of those were necessary parts of my day. And basically counting down the hours until something changed in my, lo- in my day, really. It wasn't about getting through the day. It wasn't about all the things I could accomplish. It wasn't about fulfilling my purpose. It was just about getting through the day, and that's it. I wasn't really thinking about tomorrow <laughs> or what that might bring. And so it, there wasn't security here. There was what I often refer to as a monotonous sameness about it. And, and that was a part of just the day, and that's survival. That's surviving. So what I want to do is look at six different indicators that we're living at a survival level and, and unpack them a little bit. Don't have a lot of time. But the first one is, is we choose the path of least resistance. See, survival is about conserving energy. What little I have, I want to conserve as much of my energy as possible, my emotional resources, and therefore I will choose the easiest path to accomplish whatever is in front of me to to get accomplished. And that's oftentimes why we end up making mistakes in judgment, because I simply want to get this over with because my resources are so thin. This next one is being reactive. When we're confronted with something bigger than us, something that we don't feel like we can actually have an impact on, our tendency is to wait and then react to it. Because then I can conserve my resources, I can react to it as best I know how, and then move on to the next thing. What in psychology we talk about what gets developed here is something called the internal locus of control versus external locus of control. The main concept here is locus of control, of course. And I would say before my accident, I I was an internally driven, focused individual. I felt like I could have an impact. I felt like what I did mattered. All of those things were possible. I was internally focused in my efforts to control my world and myself. And, And that was perfect, right? I mean, but then something happened. Like I said, I had this accident. And the funny thing about accidents like I had is it ripples throughout a family because everybody reacts to it differently. As a matter of fact, my two youngest were in the backyard playing, and then they heard all of this ruckus in the front yard came rolling around and seeing me laid out on the concrete. So everybody was traumatized in my family, and there's still the ripple effects of that around there. That doesn't mean that they're not thriving, but there's still the ripple effects of those things. But that one accident turned me from internal locus of control to external. It's like something bigger hit me. I don't have any capacity to take on anything new, and so I'll just wait. I'll just wait, because I don't have enough to give to to it. The next thing we tend to do is blame circumstances when things go wrong. Now, this is related to this being reactive with internal versus external locus of control. But what am I doing? Again, the biggest effort in survival is just trying to conserve what little I have. It's not expanding it. It's just conserving what I can. So when things go wrong, this this stuff comes straight at me, and I can't take it on, so therefore I push it away and blame circumstances to do that for me. When we fall into this perspective, we're, we have this pattern of seeing ourselves as victims in the world. And that's easy to fall into. It's not blameworthy. It just happens because we get confronted with maybe how little control we have versus the amount of control we think we have. Another one, the fourth one is is when things go wrong, it's proof that I'm a failure. 
And this is one of these topics I spend a lot of time talking about in shame, and shame kind of piles on. So when I do, do something and it doesn't work out, it isn't that it doesn't work out or I did something off, it's that I'm a failure. I'm a failure. So it goes from person, my person, failure, to, instead of my performance, doing something differently. And so when things go wrong, it's proof that I, um, uh, I am a failure. The fifth one is we control others by silencing ourselves. This one I can still relate to because I live in pain every day. It's like having a dull headache every day. And quite honestly, my family can't grasp that because nobody lives like that. And so what do I do? I don't tell them about it. I don't talk about it because they will think, well, what's wrong with you? You got through this. What more could you want for? I mean, this is all good, right? And it's like, yeah, but. So I silence myself because I don't want them to come to a conclusion that I probably have already come to is that, yeah, I probably am weak. I don't have the capacity to respond to some of these things. So we control others by silencing ourselves. And then the last one is, is we don't listen to hear, we listen to answer. This is part of survival living. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's conserving energy. Because when I listen to somebody and I listen to hear what's going on in their lives and what they're experiencing and those sorts of things, I'm pulling things into me to listen and hear what's going on. But if I don't see myself as having the capacity to do that or the, the bandwidth to do that, then I'm probably going to troll whatever they're saying to figure out what it is I need to tell them, and then we're good, and I can get back to surviving again. So we don't listen to hear. Now, let me tell you another story, not nearly as gruesome as the last. <laughs> and that is six months ago, I sat in my home office and I, I saw, uh, a, uh, I was leading a group uh, for my grief and loss class. And we had to, because of this pandemic, we had to go online and do Zoom um, groups, which is kind of oxymoronic in my mind, but because there's no person and person centeredness about that. So I was confronted with, don't worry, these are not CCU students. I, I was confronted with eight different faces looking back at me. And they ranged from sad to neutral to maybe even depressed, but there was one thing they all had in common and that was they wanted to connect. They wanted to connect. As a matter of fact, they wanted to connect so much that they were willing to put up with Zoom to do that. And so the, the, what's fascinating to take note of when we're looking at this is how our interactions were stilted because of Zoom interactions. And it, I call it a silo approach to communication. Imagine yourself in this silo. We, I mean, sports are calling it a bubble and people come out of the silo talk and then they go back in and then another person comes out. Since when does that, when is our communication ever that way? Ever that way? See, we, there's actually a phrase that has been given to it. It's called Zoom fatigue. See, humans communicate even when we're quiet. And we process all of this data, not only the words that people use, but relatively small nonverbal cues, like whether the person's facing me whether they're turned sideways, maybe they're, you know, they're multitasking, which you can do in Zoom, or they, they, they are fidgeting, or they are taking in a breath because they're about to interrupt. <laughs> and see, we take all these cues and it's part of the social dance even of our communication with one another. And that's all part of what we process. The thing about a video call is it impairs our ability to do that. And so when you take those away, then our intensity has to grow. They did an interesting experiment uh, or did an observation research with people that have facial paralysis, kind of like our masks. And what they found them doing is compensating with louder voices and more expression in an attempt to 
offset the loss from here down. We actually have a disorder in psychology called prosopagnosia, when somebody is face blind. And we're all suffering with it in the face of, no pun intended, of course, in the face of not being able to see one another's faces. You take all of those away, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of emotional output to, to manage what it is we see. The other phrase that we, I can bring in here from psychology is something called continuous partial attention. And the, one, one person said that we're engaged in all of these activities but not focusing on one of them. When you look at a panel of faces like this, how can we possibly scan all of these faces? It's impossible. When I used to teach cognitive psychology, I, I used to say a lot, Divided attention is no attention at all. And good example, texting and driving. Yeah, I'll have to rain on that parade. Or cooking and reading. Or anything that is high intensity, it comes along for the ride when we're talking about it. So out of these conversations, I've distilled down what I would call the threats to our, our th thriving, our ability to thrive. And the first one is the one I would refer to as the power of comparison. Or, or I would even go so far, and I've called it this before, is we live in a culture of comparison. Social media has amplified these things. And this, this comparison, when this came up and I began to hear these themes over and over again, I, I went looking for a couple philosophers that might help me kind of drive home this point. And the first one is, is one that I don't think anybody would necessarily uh, debate, but Teddy Roosevelt, because he said, comparison is the thief of joy. Why is that? Well, part of it is joy bubbles up from within us. It's an internal state, and we spend all of our time looking outward instead of experiencing what is coming from within. The other philosopher I thought was quite well and said it quite well, actually was probably a little bit more profound than Teddy Roosevelt, and it is, it is the all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful Sebastian the Crab. And he said it very simply, the seaweed is always greener in someone else's lake. <laughs> That's almost better than Teddy. So there's something I noticed as I was talking to students, and that was they compared themselves to others or people or an undefined standard of some sort. And the minute they did, they always came up short. Now, let me, let me read you a few of these things that I've heard from from students. One, this shouldn't be this hard, was the first thing I heard. Compared to, see, there it is. It's implied because if something's hard, then I got to compare it to something. But see, we don't identify that when we're talking about it in terms of comparison. Generally, it's always greener in somebody else's lake. So everyone seems to be adjusting better than I am. Everyone? So you've taken a poll on Facebook or somewhere to know that everybody is doing better than me? No, it's a matter of perception. Here's another one I really like. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> it's already implied that there's something wrong. Compared to what or whom? Another one is, this is way harder than I thought. <laughs> uh, who's been through a pandemic before to be able to judge this? See, it doesn't, really, it doesn't matter. The reality-based questions like that are not nearly as important as how it feels to me. And the feeling I have is something that I already believe, and that is I'm not going to be enough. And that impacts our capacity to actually experience this thing we're referring to as thriving. We end up comparing our real life selves with the perceived life and self of others. And we always lose, which we can't possibly know. There's a poet that came from the city that um, uh, my uh, graduate training came in, Terre Haute, that was referred to by Steve Martin as the armpit of the United States because of the unsavory smells that were around in Terre Haute. It was part of the 
charming feature of Terre Haute for us. But he wrote this in 1948 in a poem, and he penned these words about how damaging comparison is to the human soul. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. A profound statement. The, the second thing, first is comparisons. The second thing that I want to talk about is dealing with our losses. Dr. Sweeting mentioned some of these same things. Is We're living in a time where we're losing things and have lost things time and time again. The quote here from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is the denial of death that is partially responsible for people living ha- uh, empty, purposeless lives. I won't finish it, but it's the denial of death. I would even go so far as to say the denial of losses. Because in general, what we say is, well, everybody's losing something. (laughs) What is that? A comparison? So we're back to that one. So the challenge of dealing with the kind of crisis we're in, as, as Dr. Sweeting's dad mentioned, is Everything changes on a regular basis. I don't know about you, but I felt it when March hit. I would say that the pandemic was the worst birthday present I ever got. (laughs) But every time I turned around, there was something new I had to do or something I had to change or something I lost. And, And after a while, these things just start to accumulate and I grow numb of them. And I grow numb, but the costs don't stop. They keep coming, and they are very much a part of of what we have to deal with. So what have we lost? Probably first and foremost, we have lost social connection. The social connection that we once enjoyed, whether it's by Zoom or by masks or suffering in other ways of not staying connected to people, we scurry back to our safe zones, and then and then we interact by Zoom. I literally, there are some people I've interacted with, and I say, either we can sit and have masks or we can or we can visit by Zoom. And guess what they choose? Zoom. Because at least they can see our face. See faces are the key to understanding human interior. So how do we deal with these losses? One of the things I want to suggest tonight, just for your consideration, is a model that we use when we talk about grief and loss. It is not Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, by the way. Kubler-Ross was a a pioneer in in the world of grieving. I would would remind many that that Kubler-Ross, when she wrote her first book on death and dying, these stages were part uh, were descriptions of what dying people went through, not what grieving people went through. And so, this model is the is kind of the model of the day today. It's called the Tier Model, developed by Dr. Warden, Dr. Paul Warden, and it's built on the tasks we have to deal with as we go through our losses. Now, the problem we have in what we're experiencing right now is the, the serial nature of these losses. How do I keep up in dealing with these tasks as each one piles up? And so let me walk you through that. The tier model, the T in this, this model is to accept the reality of what we've lost. Now, accepting the reality of what we've lost is not the same as admitting that it exists. Because I I can talk to an amputee and he can say, yeah, I know I lost my arm. But he or she may not have dealt with what's the implications of losing my arm or losing my freedom or losing my connection with key people in my life or being isolated. That's what I'm talking about, is to accept the reality. It's a task that I begin to have to do. Now, like I said, in, in the things that we're doing now and, the, and the, the experiences we're having, we may have to do these things in aggregate because there's so many of them. And, and, and even just listing them might be a way to get it. So I can, I can assent to something being lost, but I have to figure out how do I unpack it and experience it. And, and the key goes back to connection again. Because the minute I articulate it to somebody, it now becomes real. Because it's in what I call the space between us. 
rather than the space between my ears. Because as long as it's there, I can dilute it, I can, I can distort it, I can dismiss it, I can do any number of things with the reality of that. So we have to accept the reality. The next thing is, is we have to experience the pain, that, uh, the pain of the loss that we've had. And this is, again, this goes back to connecting with others. A lot of times we, we will look at this and say, well, what good is that going to do? It's not going to accomplish anything. It's not going to bring this stuff back. Yeah, you're right if you want to use that as the standard. Because we see our emotions and a lot of our, our emoting as a functional thing. I'll do it as long as I feel better. Versus I'll do it because it expresses the fullness of what's going on in me. And I invite somebody else into it to understand it. So experiencing the pain and it connecting with others, what we have lost is not really real until we admit that it exists with somebody else that can look us in the eye and say, yeah, me too. I get it. I get it. The third one is to adjust to the environment without that loss, that thing that's lost. Now, in a lot of cases, we resist adjusting because adjusting to it means that I'm saying it's okay, and that's not true. But I have to adjust to the environment without that lost thing in it. I have to begin to reorient parts of my life. Now, the interesting thing about this particular task is that, that a lot of people, and I've talked over the years kind of unintentionally because of my book, I've talked to a lot of people that have gone through grief and loss and all sorts of things, and they want to skip the first two tasks and get right down to reorienting my life and getting on with it. I don't blame them. But the problem is, is how do I reorient if I don't know what the landscape is? The nature of what I am experiencing, the pain that I experience around it. So the one thing that we resist is admitting something exists because now I am saying it actually happened. And then the last one is reinvesting in the new reality. That's where a lot of us are. We've skipped those first two. Don't spend a lot of time. I can tell you from the groups that we were doing in grief and loss, that was a, a lifeline for a lot of our students because they got to vent about the craziness that we were all living through. And, and the venting was that admission of the pain and the things that they experienced. And so they to reinvest in this new reality is where innovation begins to show. Not, not, you know, big life change, patent pending, all that kind of innovation. I'm talking about reorienting and reinvesting in life to build it around this, this, this new thing that I'm having to deal with. We say new normal, but there's nothing normal about this, okay? So, a lot of times we'll get anxious about this adaptation, and the worst part about it is it takes us back into survival mode because of, of the anxiety we might feel. Now, let me just give you some examples of the losses that people have experienced around this, the loss to death. Obviously, there's lots of people that have died as a result of the pandemic. The, the, the loss of work, that's an everyday occurrence that we talk about in the news. The loss of financial losses, the loss of daily routine. See, we don't understand the cost of losing our routines because we're always adapting and something's different. I, <laughs> being at home as an educator, the, my routine was blown. I, I, I had my routine. I'd get up and have my coffee, which was a necessary part of survival, and I would go get everything ready and pack up everything and get in my truck and head off to school. It would take this amount of time. I would get here and do these things. I would go to class, interact, have gale time, and then we'd go back home again. That was the routine. Well, that all got blown. And my wife and I were both st stumbling over each other because now we had offices next to each other, not very well insulated, I might add. And she's talking to, you know, kids that are affective needs kids and, and, you know, having these conversations with, no, don't go that way. Keep your hands where I can see them. Keep your eyes on me. And I'm over here in my office trying to teach a class or to interact with students. 
It was, it was crazy. So daily routines are almost a bigger cost than we think. Or the loss of privacy. I've already mentioned some of these things. Or the loss of a sense of well-being. Or faith. I've, I have, um, I have uh, wrestled with students with, what, what's God up to here? What's going on? What do I do? And how do I conduct life this way? So we have all of these losses, and unfortunately, we're not really well-versed in, in dealing with loss or even with grief, uh, hence why I do my class and why I talk about it so much. Because if we deal with that, like Kubler-Ross says, if we deal with that, then we add depth to our lives for the next things that we will face because it's part of being human. So how do we focus on thriving or flourishing? What I might even call is engaging the, the abundant life. And one of the things that I would mention is, is the idea here of focusing on the future while engaging the present is the first thing I would, I would put to people as they think about and talk about, about thriving. Now, the one thing I will tell you, and, and those of you guys that are students in here with me and those that are listening online, no, I will not give you 12 quick steps to thriving. <laughs> that would be unfair and unrealistic because we, we ultimately have to pursue a lifestyle of thriving, which means that it's punctuated at times because of the assaults of life and other things that occur to us with survival, getting through. But if our set point is about thriving, then I, I know where I'm going back to. I know how to calibrate myself around those things. So the first one, like I said, is to focus on the future while keeping an eye on the present which means I know where I'm going. I know what I'm trying to accomplish in, in developing this lifestyle of thriving, but I also know there's a present here. There are things that I've lost. There are things that I tend to compare myself to and I always lose, which is another cost, or the routines I've lost, any one of those things. The second thing is focusing on purpose and calling. Interestingly enough, in a lot of the reading that I've done in preparation for this, I see it time and time again, whether it's from Christian writers or non-Christian writers, there's always a focus on what do you feel called to do? What is your purpose here? Now, as Christians, you would think we have a pretty good leg up on that, but we still lose our bearings. And that's what crisis does that. It spins us around with a, you know, a, a blindfold on and then says, walk a straight line. We can't do that. And so focusing on purpose and calling allows me to keep in mind the plumb line of what I'm shooting for as far as what God has called me to do. The, the, the phrase oftentimes is be yourself because everyone else's is taken. And so I have to get a clear understanding of what that is. And then the fourth one, and then I'll land this plane, is develop a, a sense of gratitude. Now, this is not a switch that I flip, and now I'm going to be grateful. I think it's a perspective I have to develop. A friend of mine, Brennan Manning, once said, we live in a God-saturated universe, which means that if I open my eyes, I will see the little gifts that are given to me in interactions with people and the grace that is offered me and the love and care that is offered me. What are those gifts? And when we get a gift, what do we say? Thank you. And so developing gratitude is, is a mindset of looking for the things that we have been granted and the nature of what we feel. Uh, or our experience in our interactions with each other, which is every bit as important. Gratitude gives us a perspective. Now, the last three that I want to mention, um, you know, I, I looked at it and they, they came out uh, as I was writing this out, and I thought, I can't take the teaching pastor out of me, uh, unfortunately or otherwise. And they all rhyme, I guess, or they're alliterative, or whatever you want to call it. 
but it makes it easier to remember, and that's the point, right? <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is three different things, reflection, connection, and protection as the elements around thriving. And reflection is a matter of cultivating self-reflection. In a lot of cases, we don't have a lot of time, it seems like, to take some time to look at what I call the landscape of our hearts and what's going on in there. Socrates famously once said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Self-reflection is the basis on which we enter into thriving because it creates a space. It creates a sense of need that I want to fill somehow that I can. Now, again, thrive, going from surviving to thriving isn't just flipping a switch and then we get to it. It's, it, it is a perspective. It's something to pursue. It's, it's, like I said, kind of a lifestyle. And so I encourage this all the time. All the students can roll their eyes all in unison with all the journals I have y'all read or read, write, because I want to cultivate this in you because it creates space for you with you. Not a self-absorbed space, but you can't give away what you don't own. And self-reflection and understanding the nature of the things that are going on inside of me and the acceptance I can offer those things allows me now to give to others as well. So reflection is one, self-reflection specifically. The second one, which I've been talking about all along, is connection. And connection, in order to develop the resources to grow and thrive, we need to maintain connection with one another. Oftentimes, we get very pragmatic, just like the people I talked about, mask or Zoom. Well, I'll take Zoom because at least we can see one another. That's the connect connection that we're talking about. And, and what we experience, and we need that connection. When social connection gets cut off, we have cut off a significant input into our reservoir that we're trying to develop. And so we need to find ways to maintain some measure of connection with one another because that is key to thriving. And again, this is, this is a calibration point one of the things that I, I, I do here at CCU that, that fits with both of these things is silent retreats. I've been doing these things for uh, 11 years. And, and it was first brought up as a result of a conversation I had with students in an addictions course. And I mentioned to them that that's, that's where I find my calibration. As a matter of fact, the the guys in my group that I meet with every Thursday, I say the same thing. The silent retreat is a place where one, I catch up with myself, and two, I get recalibrated around the things that are most important in terms of purpose and calling and other things along the same lines. So connection is key. Everyone has a different need or level of need. Not one is better or worse. We have different uh, needs when it comes to that. That's okay. That's okay. But the, the, like I said a minute ago, the silent retreat not only helps me to self-reflect and reflect on God and what he has to say to me and listen to him, but also to connect with other people who are doing something similar, which is a key to thriving. We have to surround ourselves with other people who are trying to run toward this goal too. So connection. The last one is protection. And whenever I, I, oftentimes I have this kind of small break system that goes on inside of me when I say this, because a lot of times we go to self-protection. But there are things about my resources that I need to protect. It's not being selfish, it is being self-caring. And so I need to protect two different things that I want to highlight. The first one is, is time protecting my time. You know, Jesus did something really quite significant, I think, and you can find it in Mark 2. 
Because Jesus spent some time in, this, in one of the villages that he was in and healing and casting out demons and everything else. And his disciples are weary from all of the expenditure of attention and everything else. Well, Jesus goes up on a mountain and prays and spends time in silence and solitude. He sets time aside. He protected his time. And so when the disciples come up, because now the villagers the next morning are knocking on their door, I don't know where they were staying, on their tent, whatever it was, and, and said, hey, where's Jesus? We want him to do more of this stuff. He goes, they go rolling up to him and say, Jesus, they want you down in this village. And what does he say? He says, no, we got somewhere else we got to go. He protects time is part of thriving the second part of that is something that I refer to as margin. I doubt any of you would remember this. Probably Dr. Sweeting might remember. There was a book entitled Margins uh, 20 years ago or so. And the author made an interesting note, and that was that when you look at the, 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 the uh, page in a textbook, the text doesn't run from the binding all the way to the end. You know why that is? Because your eyes need to rest. And so creating margin in our lives creates a capacity or an opportunity or a space to rest. And that's part of protecting our time. It requires, this is really key, it requires saying no. But if we, de we determine in our own minds that if I say no, I'm being mean or I'm, somehow I'm being uh, ugly or I'm pushing people away or I'm perceived as selfish, then I won't protect the time I need to take care of my own soul, which is the second point. I have to protect my time, and I have to protect my soul. Proverbs 4.23 very clearly says, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. You can be absolutely assured that wherever somebody finds a well, they do everything they can to protect it because of the life that comes out of it. We're called to do exactly the same thing. I'm called to guard my heart, not because some outlaw lives there, but because it is the wellspring of life. And so I have to find a way to protect it. And, and uh, to, to take care of our own hearts requires all the other things that I was talking about before. Um, so let me, let me end on uh, one last thing, and that is a, a question for you all and for you all online. Are you a ditch or a reservoir? <laughs> now, you might say, uh, beg your pardon, but are you a ditch or a reservoir? See, ditches move things from one place to another. They move water. They do all sorts of things. But the minute the inflow on that ditch ends, it goes dry. Sound familiar? <laughs> so ditches are very useful, other than when you run into them. They're very useful and functional, and they accomplish things for us. But are you a ditch or a reservoir? Well, a reservoir, on the other hand, is a very beautiful, beautiful picture, probably one of the more well-known reservoirs we have, and that's Dillon Lake. But it doesn't move things from one place to another. It stores resources to offer from its abundance, from its overflow. A reservoir is a means of taking the resources that are collected in it, and as we care for it, the overflow of it blesses and benefits everyone around us. That's what a reservoir means. But that also means that if I'm going to transfer a ditch into a reservoir, I have to say no enough to close the ends of the ditch, take care of that thing, and begin to fill it and find ways to fill it in my, my uh, relationships with others, my connection, my reflection, my time spent in, in reflection with God as well. All of those things are inputs that we bring into it when we're talking about um, uh, the, the idea of thriving. See, reservoirs need maintenance. And, and you'll notice it anywhere, is that sometimes the, the, the banks begin to erode or other things, they don't get enough inflow to be able to be full. I can still remember driving up into the mountains and seeing L L Dillon Lake 
so low that uh, there were the, the usual islands were a walk. <laughs> and I don't mean Jesus walk over water. I mean a walk. So they need to be cared for, and pursuing this inflow of resources is part of what helps us to develop into the reservoir we all really want to pursue in terms of thriving. So a ditch is about surviving. <laughs> water in, water out. A reservoir is about thriving. Water in collects and blesses the people that come out of that reservoir. So on that point, that's all I have for you. The challenge of thriving ultimately is trusting. <laughs> trusting not only what God is up to in our hearts and in each other's hearts, but trusting that if I make this choice to start moving in this direction, not flipping a switch, I'll never use that kind of language, but moving in this kind of direction that it will indeed overflow to other people's benefit. We're always gonna have people that want to dip out of the reservoir and empty it. We will always have that. And if we're held hostage by people saying, I need more, I need more, without us saying, I need time, I need to protect my soul so that I can help other people, then, then we're, we're, we're stuck in one or the other. And, and as I said before, a lot of times survival and thriving is, is intermixed. They're not discrete periods of time. In, in some points in time, you know, I, we were just talking about this with midterm and, and people feeling like so tired by this time because of all the, the, the demands on our time and, and demands from classes and everything else. And what do I try to do? with our, even our silent retreats, as I insert it into the middle of the semester, you know why? For me, <laughs> I'll just take other people along for the ride. I need the space to recalibrate and then run after the end of the semester as well, just like you guys do as well. So I'm gonna stop it there. Um, we're gonna be taking uh, questions uh, and hopefully I'll have some answers. So you, you can, uh, for those of you online, you can text or email your question to question at ccu.edu. There's a reminder here that um, there is some incentive for being here um, and uh, from uh, to get chapel credit. But I am going to stop at this point and see if there's any questions from anybody here. <clears throat> Right. 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 <laughs> A micro nap, maybe. Um, <clears throat> actually, that was when the three showed up. The reflection, connection, and protection were after that. And those were the three. Other questions that you have? I'll take frustrations, too. Yeah. So the question is, is how, how, do, uh, how have I managed the transition from surviving to thriving? Um, I, I think I, I, I lived in that place and thought that that's all there was. Um, <clears throat> I think when I began to wrestle through at times and come to you know, a lot of times what we'll say, come to the end of myself, and I really didn't have any resources left, I began to ask the real questions about where do I want to go and what do I want to be? Not what do I want to do, but what do I want to be? And what do I need to cultivate in my life to be able to start doing that? So that wasn't, I, I don't know that that was a, a, a epiphany of sorts. I think it was a slow accumulation of bumping up against places that my old strategies weren't 
working and weren't going to continue to work. And that was true in relationships. That was true in what I thought about what my job should be or how much money I should make or the things that I should do. Quite honestly, where I am here at CCU has probably been the longest period of time of thriving for me, even though it's tough and hard to do and anything else. I think when I first came here to CCU, I was still in the throes of, of pain management and I was surviving. I was literally surviving. I would get to classes and I would talk, but I had literally, I had, I had wires coming out of the back of my head with the neurostimulators. I had, I had something in the vicinity, of eight or nine different surgeries to get them placed correctly. So, you know, students were walking behind me thinking I was ET or something because I had a phone cord coming out the back of my head. But I, I kept bumping up against that in, in, in my closest relationships. I bumped up against my strategies of survival were hurting the people around me. And I, I, had, I didn't have to, but I chose to make a different choice. Now that didn't mean, bam, I got it all. I, I, we, you know, I, I had my own set of counseling. I had my own times of talking and inventing and, and wrestling with things about whether it was the church or whether it was ministry or what, what I was, what I was supposed to do. And if you had asked me 20 years ago or 30 years ago, which would probably be better, uh, um, you, you're going to be teaching in the last part of your career or life, I'd say you are out of your mind. And yet, this is, this is a, a full expression, which I am immensely grateful for, a full expression of just exactly what God's called me into. I tried everything else. <laughs> and, and I found the answer was, no, not there. Not there. And I say, okay. I gain enough humility to say, okay, I'll try something else. And, and then I finally land here. So other questions? Yeah, Sierra. Okay, so if you've experienced a period of surviving and then you've moved into thriving, yeah. what do you do with like the fear of going back to surviving? <laughs> Slash, how do you prepare to be like, less bad. <laughs> <laughs> less bad. Yes, I, I love the question. Yeah, I, um, the, the question is, I don't know if people on, online hear this or not, but the question is, is once I, once I, I, I've been in survival mode, now I've moved into thriving, what do I do with um, worrying about going back? And, and generally, I think what my first response would be is it's not a matter of if you go back, it's when, and then saying, what's what, and it goes back to what I talked about earlier, what's my calibration point? My calibration point is around thriving, not around surviving. And so when I, when I start to quote unquote, kind of lose ground and I'm going back into survival mode, it's not, that's not the time to, to beat the heck out of myself and say, what are you doing? You're, you can't do anything right. What's wrong with this? It's more a matter of, yes, this is where I am. What kinds of things and activities or engagements or um, uh, connections can I make to start incrementally moving back into that thriving place? And so it's not a matter of if, it's when. And so that way, then we don't catastrophize it into the worst thing that could ever happen because I'm back to survival mode again. Because I, I think in a lot of cases, we, even when we make thriving our calibration point where, where we want to make it a standard, we're still going to cycle through because of just the demands and the things that assault us. That, that has gotten even more profound, I think, during this pandemic because there's so much outside of us that I can do absolutely nothing about. I can do plenty of things individually in response to it. But I, you know, I, I can't get Colorado to be in the blue zone or whatever zone they're supposed to be in, in terms of, of infection rate. I, I can't impact that, but I can recognize it for what it is and then begin to move in, the, in that way toward that standard. Once I get the standard clear for me, then I can start moving in that direction. I may not get all the way there, but that, that's okay. 
it, it's, it, it is dealing with ourselves, which you're hearing about, is graciously and allowing myself the space to keep trying and not to do it perfectly. So other questions? Yeah, so um, how can a person in chronic pain move towards thriving when you're hurting so badly, it's hard to move up the chain to more existential thoughts? <laughs> wow, we used existential. Wow, I, I'm impressed. I, I, I think to some, uh, I think with people that are in chronic pain, we set a different level. And, and so, and that level has to be built on the reality of where we are and what way things are and exist. And so what that means then is that my calibration point for thriving doesn't get lowered. I'm not making any comparison with anyone else because I, I, I've already told you, I, I live in that kind of pain all the time. But I still would say I'm, I'm, I'm for the most part thriving the the um the the way to do that is one resist comparison then two is also um adjusting adjusting the thrival thriving point to what is possible in where i am not where i should be where i want to be but where i am and accepting that makes thriving possible and that creates the space for it yeah um, so you mentioned the path of least resistance was like one of the signs of knowing you're yeah. not thriving and you're just surviving. Do you think that's easy to kind of slip into even when you're not kind of what when you're not in chronic pain or when you're not going through the pandemic and it's just like everyday life? Is that something that's kind of common? Yeah, I, you know, again, I think that's why that's why I connected it up with the idea of resources is that, you know, on on any given day, we might say, uh, I don't have enough resources to get through this day. And so I'll just pick the easiest things to get through and, and call, it, call it good. So yes, I think even, even in the larger scheme of things, we can choose the path of least resistance. I think sometimes, and I, I can't be the judge of this, somebody else has to be the judge of it, but sometimes I think we underestimate our capacity and overestimate the demand of what we have. And so, and that's fine, I can do that. But at the same time, if I'm gonna build capacity, then I probably have to try to meet the demand that I have. And, and so a lot of that is built on trying to see things realistically as it is, not as I want it to be, as it is. And so, yes, absolutely, I see that a lot. Um, and, and we do that, and what do we say? I do that, I'm just trying to survive. And you're right, literally, with those choices, it's just about survival. It's not trying to expand my capacity to do things. So yeah. Any other questions? Grace or Abigail? I'm not sure if I can articulate this exactly how I want to. Okay. <laughs> um, but there's a culture around self-care where it's just do the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. to like, do what you can to survive this day or to get through this day. And right. Like, give yourself the grace to do that and that's yeah. the way to like take care of yourself in some sense mm -hmm. do you think that can pair along with thriving so like in your seasons of thriving sometimes you do have to find days or moments where you have to do the bare minimum and that's taking care of yourself absolutely absolutely i actually it goes with what what um olivia mentioned about the the on some of those days i need to look at my resources realistically and say um you know i i I really, I don't have it for today. So I'm gonna do whatever I can to get through it so it's survival for the day. And then I recalibrate and then I kind of reassess where I'm at and say, all right, how can I move back to expanding a little bit more? But yeah, self-care is, is always built on the acceptance of what is, not what should be. Should always comes with a comparison most of the time. And so, um, so yeah, it, it, it's very much that way, I think. 
that, and that's why I say it's like you said, you know, the seasons of thriving versus the seasons of th surviving. It doesn't mean that even in the season of thriving, I'm going to have low resources at, at some given point in time. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to do the best I can. That just the best I can, not the best according to somebody else or compared to somebody else. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. So what does the transitionary period between surviving to thriving <laughs> kind of look like? Or whatever you want to do with that. The, the, moving from surviving to thriving, what's the period in between? It's messy. Merry Christmas. No, I, it's messy. It's messy. Will I get it right every time? No, of course I won't. But again, a little bit like the point I said with, with um, uh, thriving is keep an eye on the future while engaging the present. And that really is the key to getting to thriving. That's where I'm heading. I will do what I can in the decisions I have to make today to, to move in that direction. Will I get it right every time? No, I won't. That's okay. But I still have got the future. I'm not going to let that be the absolute ideal, but it gives me a target. And, and when, when we make thriving a target, then I can engage the present with the choices I make now that will impact that thriving at a later point in time. And that's, that's, that's I think that's kind of the key in a lot of ways to thriving. So anything else? Any other questions or anything? Okay. So look ahead uh, three years down the road and, mm -hmm. and then look back at this period. What do you think the good is going to be that comes to particularly students who have gone through this challenging, interesting, rocky period? <laughs> yeah. What's the good to come out of it? <clears throat> Actually, I, I think there's probably going to be a lot of unexpected goods. I mean, we can have the conversation like, in the good old days when we made it through a pandemic and we can we can say you guys know nothing about that we 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 had to wear masks all the time um so but i i think the other part is actually capacity building that we didn't know we had and and so i you know me as a professor i'm doing things i never thought i would I would be able to do, and I grouse my way through it and all of that. But when I get to the other end, I can look back and say, I, I did that. I, I actually did that. And it's like, well, if I did that then, I might be able to do it under better circumstances. And the same thing is true, I think, with gratitude or with connection or with any other of these things that I'm talking about is that the level of connection I can experience around a common adversary, which we know the pandemic is out there. Now I bond with somebody with that. And maybe some of the bonds that you walk away with from this time will be very different than the bonds you would, would have had under any other circumstances, because we have a common adversity we're facing. And so uh, we develop a language around that. We develop this, these ideas of acceptance and linking arms and doing the best we can and all of these concepts of, of the, like I said, reflection and connection and protection. And, and we hold each other up in that regard. That's things that we wouldn't normally do. I, really, I, th I wonder how much of our conversation has changed. If we could capture the conversations we're having now versus where we had three years ago or what we will have three years hence from now, I think there's going to be some real gems in there. There's going to be some real jewels in there of what we've learned, not only about ourselves, but about the critical importance of relationship and connection that we have. We knew it before, but now it has been reduced and we're saying, oh yeah, that was, that was key to my sur survival. And now I can use it for my, for my thriving in the world around me. So I, I, I think we find unexpected things that, that is part of that. I think the one thing that is a threat to that is our expectations of how things should be. And that interferes with our ability to actually find the gems here. It, our expectations um, oftentimes cloud my ability to assess things as they are. And I think, I think that's part of some of the conversation we can have.
So any other questions? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for your kind attention, and I'll see you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mitch, for giving us your time and reflecting your own journey, but also helping us with ours. Have a great night.